Well, uh, this is a gigantic experiment. For people who are joining us on the web, first of all, let me describe the scene here. We've got, I guess, about 100 people, maybe a little less than that, in a lecture theatre at the University of British Columbia. Uh, and at the front of the lecture theatre, uh, the plenary speakers, except for Terence Deacon, who had to return to Berkeley, and uh, Linda Kress, who was ill and unable to join us here at uh, ICFC. We've been having a very stimulating set of discussions over the week and uh, enjoying ourselves enormously. We wanted, as a program committee, to build in an opportunity for reflection in the Congress in any case, but uh, additional to that, we wanted to experiment with providing digital access as far as we can uh, for people who are unable to travel to British Columbia. We wish you were here, but you're not, so we'll try to uh, include you in the discussion. Uh, if you happen to have a Twitter account and you want to follow discussion on that, I think if you go to Language Life on Twitter, I'm not an expert in Twitter, but I understand Language Life is the point you need to go to and you can follow discussion and contribute to discussion on Twitter as well. So we're going to begin, or I should also say, sorry, that we've got uh, chat rooms established, just so everybody knows what uh, is happening. We've got chat rooms established in uh, different regions of the world. If you happen to be accessing the web and listening to this audio stream, uh, you, unless you're in one of those chat rooms, you won't be able to contribute to a chat room. But um, there are people around the world who are included in the chat room, including in Brazil, in China, in Nigeria, and in India. Have I left anybody out? That seems to be right. So we're looking forward to receiving uh, contributions from people in those various regions uh, to this discussion here in Vancouver. So the plenary uh, people I'm going to identify and then ask uh, if they will comment on a particular question. The question is designed to help people who are accessing this discussion through the web to get some sense of, of the uh, discussion that we've been having here around the general conference theme of language evolving. And I'm going to start with Professor Michael Halliday, who's sitting on the far right of the group here, uh, and ask him if he would comment on the issue or set of issues that's most attracted his attention under the general theme of language evolving, as that are issues that seem to be taking our understanding forward or that we urgently need to address in order to take our understanding forward. Um, thanks, Jeff. That uh, sounds as if it could be quite a long lecture, but it won't be, I assure you. Now, I think several of us here at this conference have referred to the distinction between language evolving, which is our conference theme, uh, and linguistics evolving, which is a different process. Although, I think we can easily see an analogy between these two, because I think that uh, um, our systemic functional linguistics has in fact always evolved through our continuing to engage with newer and broader areas of application. Which is what I mean when I've been describing what we do as appliable linguistics. But my impression is that here we've been taking this one step further. Now, we're familiar, I think, with the concept of co-evolution. Terence Deacon gave us this notion notion of the co-evolution of language and the human brain. What I think we've been seeing here is another aspect of this same co-evolutionary phenomenon, uh, namely the co-evolution of language and linguistics, as our theory matches up uh, with the uh, evolution in the context and the functions of language itself. At the same time, I think, our papers and discussions uh, have made it clear that language remains and has to remain at the center, and that all those who read and write multimodally, with all the wonderful artifacts that Giovanni Parodi was telling us about this morning, we're, they are able to do so because they also read and write and speak and listen to language. That's how they learn to mean and how they continue to display, to display most of their meaning potential throughout life. And a final point, that goes on in lots and lots of different languages. And that is the other frontier along which I think the theory continues to evolve. Thank you, Michael, very much. So, 
So uh, on Michael's <coughs> left is uh, Giovanni Parodi from Chile, and uh, I'm going to ask the same question, uh, Giovanni. Uh, what issue or set of issues do you uh, consider so important? Well, following Michael's idea, I believe that the distinction you stated between the uh, language evolution and linguistics evolution, I believe that in considering linguistics evolution, there is a very interesting point that I would like to make is that the technology, I believe that uh, we, we should, I mean, go into the uh, frontier of uh, technological support for research. I believe that in some parts of the world, linguistics is still in the, I mean, pre-technological uh, development. And I believe that one way to, to advance, to really advance in what we need in the study of language, language variation, language use, um, or language structure, is to, I mean, uh, capitalize from the technological advancements. And, uh, so one way is to, uh, for instance, use uh, the website or the softwares that we have nowadays. And of course, that a, a, has a great point for me, that is that we can share easily our, our research. And so that could take linguistics um, to a new area, I believe. And I think that we should, I mean, use more than what we are doing now uh, the, the, the exploit technology. Not only in corpus linguistics, because somebody could say that I'm just trying to raise my own area, <laughs> but I'm talking in general. So uh, I believe that we should move and use technology, not only for description, but also for, for experimental investigation, that I believe it's also one step ahead that in linguistics, particularly in the, in the strict sense of linguistics, I, I don't think that we are making much use of it. So I, I would rather have uh, um, the second part of Michael with the linguistics evolution and, and pay attention to the way we are doing research and the way we could capitalize from new advancements that I believe we are not using as much as we could. As one who lives in the technological past, <laughs> I, mean, I am digitally challenged, you see. I do quite agree with you. <laughs> And uh, then to, we're passing to Christian Matheson from uh, Hong Kong Polytechnic University and Macquarie University. With the same question, yes. Yeah, same question, yeah. thank you. Uh, yes, warm greetings to, to all of you here, uh, materially and virtually. Uh, it's been uh, a very, very energizing and, and stimulating Congress so far. Uh, I think as is always the case, you get, you get so many different aspects, facets of contributions uh, on or around the, the Congress theme. Uh, and with a Congress theme like this, a very broad theme, but a challenging theme, uh, there are ways then of interpreting various contributions precisely in the, in the environment of the theme. Uh, let me start with one thing that's, that's uh, struck me in a sense. Uh, you remember one thing in, in uh, Michael Halliday's uh, book, Class, uh, Language and Social Semiotic, uh, I think I must have read it very soon after it appeared in, in 78, and I don't think I quite understood this point he made where he said we're not bounded by the skin. Uh, and that was a challenge to, to come to grips with. Uh, now, in a sense, I think the talk that Terence Deacon gave as a, as a neuroscientist, biologist, evolutionary biologist, uh, drove home this point to me. It, it didn't occur to me until the end of the day uh, when, when uh, uh, we sort of moved away from the conversations. Uh, but I think the, the interesting point that Terence made coming, as I said, from neuroscience biology, if you think about where is information located in human systems, uh, then he's shown very clearly the sort of complementarity of information that's located material and immaterial in a sense. So information that is located in us as biological organisms and that is uh, the focus of genetics, for example, uh, and then information that is located in immaterial human systems, so social and semiotic systems, the kinds of things that are picked up under headings like social learning, uh, social semiotic learning, or the notion of collective brain uh, that becomes possible with language, uh, and suggesting that through the 
evolution of, of our species, there's kind of been a shift uh, and that we can understand language in these terms. Uh, and that, uh, to me, is, is a very powerful demonstration, uh, precisely in a sense because it comes from below, meaning it comes from uh, a very deep understanding and research into biology and neuroscience. Uh, but it does match up with and resonate with the perspective from above, in a sense, uh, that we're not bounded by, by our skin. And I think I'm beginning to, to, to understand what you were saying in 1978. <laughs> so a little bit of time like that. But <laughs> Uh, but it is a very, very important point, and it goes... It's never late. It's never late? Yes. Okay, that's good. <laughs> uh, I think it goes together with, with a number of other uh, contributions to the Congress, the emphasis on, on, on learning, uh, and so the connection between uh, the phylogenetic time frame and the ontogenetic time frame, and ultimately the logogenetic time frame. Uh, and the sort of explosion in the acceleration of change in human history that becomes possible once we sort of move up from the main burden being on, on biological evolution uh, to moving into social and semiotic evolution. Uh, now having said evolution here, uh, let me just sort of round off by saying I think uh, it seems to be important. We know that uh, it's, it's, it's not correct to talk about uh, our universe evolving, because physical systems don't evolve, they change, cosmogenesis as astrophysicists talk about. But with the emergence of biological systems we can talk about evolution. And of course this also applies to social and semiotic systems. Uh, but the interesting question here for us I think is partly the complementarity of, of evolution and intervention or evolution and design. Uh, and the, the question of how we can understand these very complex processes to be more successful in sort of intervention in social and semiotic systems. Uh, and I think a large part of that is understanding, understanding uh, the e evolution of complex systems uh, and the sense that uh, anything that we could design couldn't possibly be as complex as things, systems that evolve. Okay? Uh, I think what we need, we need lots of things, but one, one uh, I think, is sort of the understanding of language is evolving as aggregates of registers and ways of linking up uh, sort of shorter time frames, even the time frame of, of life of an individual and what we understand from, from uh, processes of learning and so on, and that is a filter in, 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 the, in Terence Deacon's sense. With the longer time frames, the evolution of a language, uh, uh, the evolution of language in the human species and so on. So lots of exciting uh, work to be done and I feel that it's it's a very timely, the period is, is, is right, because we're finally coming together with, uh, not with a cognitive uh, view from, from, from mainstream cognitive science, and I don't mean what you're talking about, but mainstream cognitive science that's sort of borrowed from computer metaphors, but yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, see what you mean. cognition and interaction yes. on the one hand, and, and neuroscience on the other hand. So it's an exciting period to be around. Thank you, Christian, very much. And uh, Kazuhiro Taruya, also from the uh, Hong Kong Polytechnic University. Uh, he, we haven't actually heard from Kazu, so this is the first time he's spoken. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> he's about okay. To, uh, to do that tomorrow morning okay. at some length. But let's hear now. Thank okay. you. When I think about uh, language evol evolving or language evolution, two things come into my mind. First is the uh, uh, word languages, like uh, we say English or Englishes. Uh, Spanish, I don't know if you say Spanish is, yes. do you? <laughs> but what about Chinese? I don't know Chinese is, <laughs> but I don't know. And also on the other hand, this is a flourishing languages, and we speak those languages which enable us to communicate uh, uh, widely, so that's a very positive aspect of evolving language and dissemination information, shared uh, experience, it becomes possible. But on the other hand, what comes into mind is um, uh, assimilation, fusion, decay, and also, also death of uh, minority languages. So if we say there are 6,000 6, languages in the world, and for us to describe it in order to keep our uh, heritage, that is uh, uh, language, uh, we need 6,000 well-trained <laughs> systemic functional grammarians, <laughs> 6,000. So we have probably here about 200 people. We need 6,000 people. And to train them, we need probably eight or nine years. 
from undergraduate, and they have to go through postgraduate, they will have to write description as part of the PhD, or as a hobby, and whatever it is. Okay, and also we have uh, dealing with the language, metafunctional organization of language. So if we need to develop a uh, description which is really useful for us to understand uh, the language itself, and also how the language is organized, and you know, how the language has evolved or is evolving, we need probably uh, three years for meta one each metafunctions, so as Christian says. So we need nine years to describe very comprehensive description of language. So we have 6,000 6, languages, we need 6,000 people, we need <laughs> nine years, and, and plus nine years. So this, but at the same time, uh, in the corner of the world, language is decaying, dying. So what can we do? So I think that is a, a huge issue that we are facing currently. Thank you, Kazu, very much. And next to Kazu is Mary Schleppergirl from the University of Michigan, who uh, talked to us yesterday morning in the Congress about her work in uh, Michigan, in Detroit in particular, with some inner city schools and grammatics. Mary, over to you. Thank you. Well, as someone interested in education, I've been especially interested in the many papers presented here that are asking questions about our use of the meta language with teachers and with children in classrooms. And as I've listened to these papers, I've been thinking about where our work needs to evolve in order to have the arguments we're making be more convincing to others in the education research community and to the teachers that we want to work with. So for example, what are the best ways for us to track and measure teachers' development in this area? So how we can look at teachers as they use the meta language in ways that engage children in meaningful discussion where they're connecting language and meaning. How can our research tools evolve in ways that we can study that? How can we study the children's own language development when several papers here have shown that it's never linear, that we need new tools to be thinking about what has developed and the direction of movement in children's evolution of their meaning potential. So I think that some key issues for us as we move forward are to evolve new ways of doing our research so that we're able to offer more convincing evidence to others and to help us also better understand aspects of the differences in context text, participation structures that are going to give us affordances for really supporting this important work with children in classrooms. Thank you, Mary, very much. And now to Annabelle Lucan. She's one of two Sydney-based people who will be talking next. Annabelle is at Macquarie University in the Centre for Language and Social Life. Thanks, Jeff. Um, I was very struck in Terry Deacon's paper that he managed to make an argument which included the brain, genes, society, and language. Uh, and I took the message to be that you can have all of those elements in your theory and description, but you have to keep the complexity at each scale. So for instance, it's not gonna work if you have a reductive view of the gene or a reductive view of language. You've got to keep the complexity at all those scales. Now, in one sense, um, people in the SFL school are sometimes criticised for that complexity, uh, but I think Michael has consistently made the point that we, we don't do any favours by simplification or being reductive in our accounts of language. So one of my kind of burning questions is how we manage that complexity and deliver on the potential of the theory and the description. How do we do it in an environment where even in a small group like this, we have considerable disagreement? So for instance, Jim's paper tomorrow will be talking about two dialects, I think that's the word, two dialects of the theory. No, <laughs> another word for it. Registers at least, probably languages. Okay, sorry. So, okay. so the point I think to borrow the evolution metaphor is 
speciation. So we're getting two species, and there are more than that. And they can't meet. Right. Okay. <laughs> so if that kind of speciation continues, what we lose is the potential to compare and contrast, you know, empirical banks of data that have been analysed with sufficiently comparable descriptions that we can start to solve some of these complex problems. So, we, as I say, we have the problem that there's a lot of disagreement even amongst a small group of us here. And moreover, the academic zeitgeist, I think, encourages us to disagree. So, no, you know, to be a self-respecting academic, you have to be new, innovative, um, and so, as I say, we're encouraged to differentiate ourselves mm. rather than to, you know, take some developments that may be 30 years old and say, maybe we need another 50 years to fully understand the implications of, say, some aspects of Michael's theory. Thank you. And then over to Jim Martin, who's based at the University of Sydney uh, and uh, is a Canadian by origin, so he's uh, at home but uh, displaced. I tried to demonstrate that. <laughs> I've been wandering around thinking about lemons and squirrels most of the time. Lemons because I learned that we can't make vitamin C and language is a lemon that we have to somehow develop in social relations with others. And I'm thinking about squirrels because there are the main animal that I miss from Canada living in Australia. For those of you who don't know what squirrels are, they're a little animal that lives in trees with a great bushy tail and they run around a lot of the time of the year when they're not hibernating with their cheeks full of food, which they then squirrel away uh, for eating during the winter. And um, I think if language is a lemon, we're the squirrels, and that we build knowledge and squirrel it away in writing, uh, deposit it in archives of various kinds, electronic or physical. And that creates the problem then of how is it that people get the knowledge. So related to what Mary was saying, how do we get it? I mean, the knowledge doesn't actually live in our heads, our heads here. If you think the things I've written are in my head, you're completely wrong. All I could ever do would be to show you where they are and mediate, give you a glimpse of what the knowledge is that lives in that writing. So it puts a lot of pressure on schooling. The question is, how do you mediate for everyone more than a, just an elite of people uh, access to that knowledge that's squirreled away? Uh, I think we know some things. We know that if we can somehow in institutionalized learning, mimic the notion of guidance through interaction in the context of shared experience. If we can position teachers in that kind of relationship to students, we can begin to mediate access to the written knowledge. We also know that if we have some kind of meta-language to talk about the nature of that knowledge, that will also open up access. Now, we've got the challenge, I think, in terms of tweaking these ideas through primary, secondary, tertiary education because the knowledge that's squirreled away is not all of one kind, but it's tiered in various dimensions of uh, <coughs> immaterial evolution, which is um, the thing I think I'll take away from the conference. Am I allowed to ask you a question? Yes, yeah, sure. OK, yeah, so I'll, I'll turn it around by asking a question. So one thing that's puzzled me over the years that Christian and Michael know, because I've complained many times to them, is the model of emergent complexity where you take physical, biological, social, and semiotic as four distinct tiers, and Christian presented this again at this conference. So I have never been able to imagine as a social semiotician how you can have social without semiosis, and indeed in your talk, Christian, you seem to start the proto-language in the social realm of development this time, so it seemed to me you were putting the social semiotic together. So I was wondering if Michael and Christian could comment on whether they want four tiers or three. I'm very happy with physical, biological, and social semiotic. I'm extremely puzzled as ever by physical, biological, social, and then semiotic. Well, that maybe mean. within the ants. <laughs> <laughs> do, do you want to expand, Michael? Sorry. Do you... oh, sorry. I, I, do you want? Yeah. No. All I was saying was, of course, it depends on uh, how you're going to define semiotic. Uh, we tend in that uh, in that particular taxonomy. Uh, to think of semiotic in the sense of our higher order semiotics as human beings, uh, in which case, excuse me, in which case there are, I think, certainly uh, social creatures, that's why I mentioned ants, uh, that, as it were, would fit in that slot under the heading of social but not semiotic. Now, I admit, I mean, it depends how far you could extend the term semiotic right back to basic physical systems and say that, you know, any form of organization is, is meaning. 
Um, but this is in a different framework. Christian, would you like to comment on that one? Uh, well, uh, part of the comment I think was would be, uh, I mean, in, in, in phylogenetic. I mean, sorry, in, in, in yeah, in phylogenetic terms, we. Uh, I don't think there is a way of establishing uh, sort of the different time frames of emergence for these systems. And as a, I, I suspect that they would emerge several times. I mean, Richard Dawkins says that the eye evolved about the forty different times. Yeah. I think the same would be true of, of social and semiotic systems. Uh, I think the fact that uh, you typically have semiosis, semiotic organization with social organization doesn't mean that analytically it's not helpful to pull them apart. But take something like, uh, you know, teamwork, moving furniture or uh, surgery in an operating room. This is essentially social activity uh, and it's a traditional notion of language and action. So language comes in simply to coordinate, to facilitate this. But the, the main activity in, in, in such context, it seems to me, is, is social and the semiotic then, as opposed to a uh, context where the semiotic is constitutive of, of the context, whether it's language or some other, uh, some other kind of semiotic. <laughs> the people listening, Jim has just shrugged. Or some other form of <laughs> In obvious disbelief. Time to open. <laughs> uh, I must say that that uh, question has been raised by a number of people in the audience uh, during the Congress, so it might well be that other people want to, to join in that conversation in a little while. Um, in the auditorium in uh, Vancouver, we have a microphone uh, which will be taken around the group by Micah, one of the grad students in our department. Um, but we've also got uh, four computers here with people operating this chat room. So I'm going to just ask if there is somebody in a chat room who's raised a question in relation to this discussion that we could take. I think from Brazil we've got a question. Is that right? Well, I'm not sure if we have a question, but we have a lot of, you know, courses. We have uh, students from Masters and PhD online. They are watching their, they are having their classes with you at the same time. So this is really exciting for me. It's the first time I've, I've done this. So I've, I've, I've posted, um, I've written the possibility of them interact. They might have questions in a while. Okay. Well, welcome to the people in Brazil who are doing their uh, graduate work through this uh, medium. We're delighted to know that you've joined us. Um, Remember that it's only, <coughs> it's only 4.30 in the morning in China, so give them time. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to expect a lot more questions, you mean, yes. Okay, what about in the other chat rooms? Is there anybody who would like to raise a question? People who are uh, joining the chat rooms, please feel really welcome to join in the conversation here in Vancouver. Uh, I'll give you a visual image while we're just uh, getting ready to take a microphone around that uh, here in Vancouver there's a battle between the black squirrels and the grey squirrels. So I don't know if they store their information in the same way or their food in the same way, but it'll be an interesting thing to look at. We've got it uh, different species. So uh, to the audience in uh, this auditorium, are there some questions that you would like to raise about what has been said so far? So we're going to, uh, I won't be able to say the name of everybody in the group, but uh, this is Derek Irwin, who's uh, working currently in China and uh, previously did his PhD at York University in, uh, in Canada. Uh, yeah, so I, this is an open question, I suppose. I, I'm wondering uh, what we think of the metaphor of evolution as it's used for language. Because it seems to me in some ways it's very accurate, but it, in other ways maybe not. So is there a, a way to improve upon that metaphor or a way to uh, think about language change as perhaps not an evolution. Is anybody particularly wanting to take up this question? Christian. Just maybe a very, very quick comment mm -hmm. that uh, uh, I, I think the way you introduced it is, is, is important to, uh, and, and it's a usual thing, right? We, so we take, the, we take the theory of evolution from uh, the understanding of biological systems and where it was important to sort of make the move from the understanding of, of, of theoretical uh, breakthrough in modern science to physical systems and something different was needed, uh, some notion of time and that had been around in, 
in, in sort of looking at geological systems and like from the Romantic era and so on. So it was kind of in the air. Uh, now, uh, I think there's a general sense in which we can use it. I, I think we still need to, to do a fair amount of work to uh, sort of make explicit what we mean by talking about uh, even social systems evolving, certainly language languages evolving. Uh, and one question is, what would be the unit of, of evolution as it were? So one person who's looked at this uh, a few years ago is Daniel Nettle, uh, and he suggested that the word should be treated as a sort of unit of evolution when you look at language languages. Now, I'm not sure that that, that, that uh, sits very comfortably with us, but it's just to problematize precisely the issue you, you, you raise and saying, um, from my point of view, yes, we need to, need to do more, more work to explore it. Uh, but one context, it seems to me, that again the, the uh, work by uh, Terence Deacon opens up is precisely looking at this, uh, the notion of co-evolution and the sort of shift between systems of different orders. I mean, something that evolved biologically, then social systems take over and or semiotic systems. So there must be a sense in which we can extend the notion of evolution. But again, the question of where does design, where does intervention come in, I think it, that also has to be sorted out carefully. Jim is going to comment. Just to make this a little more specific, because it's something I get in terrible trouble with and would appreciate advice, but I'm certainly quite happy to try and argue that a language that has the grammatical metaphor that writing affords is more highly evolved than languages which don't that that language affords technology and bureaucracy, which can then put another culture and language group at risk within one generation. And so it's a very stark reality you have to face. So we have to be able to keep talking about that. And if talking about it in terms of evolution is something that's too inflammatory, um, and we need to find another term great, probably Mary's the kind of person we need to find a nicer way of saying this. Because <laughs> she can do it sweetly. I always end up notorious. So. <laughs> Okay, other, other comments? Good. So we have somebody joining us from uh, the Brazil chat room yeah. through Danielle. Yeah. Um, this comes from Elaine Espindola from Brazil. She says she sends warm greetings and many thanks for the possibility of being interacting with you. Um, she, she says that the question might be um, directly addressed to Professor Halliday, Christian, and Kazu. She says here, um, according to Ortega, the next phase of the development in the area of systemic function should be the bilingual turn. Do you think that due to the social interactive turn that systemic function offers to linguistics, is it, the heading to, um, is it heading to the same path given that bilingualism is occupying a much more central role in our conceptions of language evolution and or linguistic evolution? Thank you. Could we have it again? would you mind? Thank you. Oh, yeah, okay. Um, basically, the question would be um, Do you think that due to the social interactive turn that systemic functional linguistic offers to linguistics, um, is it heading to the same path given that bilingualism? is occupying a much more central role in our conceptions of language evolution? Good try. Uh, so Christian is going to, uh, to lead off with this and then we'll yeah, come to Yeah, maybe next. very quickly and then that uh, can, can uh, follow up. I mean, I, I think it's, it's a very central question. Uh, and we could take it, I think, at two levels. I mean, the uh, level of language and the level of meta-language of linguistics. Uh, I think it's 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 uh, it's interesting to uh, note the level of language, and then come back to the level of linguistics, as it were. I mean, the meta language. That uh, uh, it's very likely that the, the bilingual term, the multilingual term, was part of the human condition for most of human history. Uh, so the monolingual term is, as it were, exceptional. Uh, just as as these uh, huge bloated languages like English are exceptional in human history, uh, that probably through most of, of human history, uh, speakers lived in fairly small communities, a few hundred to a few thousand uh, speakers, 
but in a context, in interaction with other communities speaking other languages, where the language sort of symbolized the identity of the community, uh, but speakers would typically be bilingual or even multilingual. Uh, and in a book, recent book by Nick Evans, uh, a linguist based in Australia, who's done a lot of work on Australian Aboriginal languages, uh, the book is called Dying Words. Uh, he uh, describes the situation in, in say, parts of, of um, northern, uh, northern Australia uh, and uses that as a way of, of sort of suggesting what the picture would have been like uh, throughout most of human history. And it seems very plausible. And his point is that in some sense linguistics has been skewed. I mean, we know that linguistics has been skewed by the fact that it's been linguistics of, of sort of the the image of writing in a sense uh, and that this is now been corrected by, by sort of our ability to observe, record and, and, and annotate spoken discourse. But similarly he suggests that our image of, of language has been skewed by a focus on these big languages uh, and that we need a sort of corrective looking at, uh, at smaller languages and smaller communities to understand what, what the in some sense, the more predominant condition of it. So that's, that's at the level of language. At the level of, of uh, linguistics, it seems to me, and people like, like Lourdes Ortega have talked about this in relation to the sort of study of second uh, foreign language learning, uh, SLA, uh, suggesting that uh, a SLA has moved through the sort of social interactive term, uh, but is now into the bilingual term, uh, and it's an important development that she promotes, uh, bilingual, multilingual, uh, and of course Alina's interest and work on and expertise in translation is a very, very, very important part of this picture. Uh, but again, it's, it's sort of saying that we shouldn't take the sort of monolingual situation as uh, a model for understanding what it is we're trying to do in second foreign language teaching. Uh, uh, rather, we should try to understand what uh, people who are fluently multilingual do, not, not sort of compare with monolinguals, uh, and that that would lead to a lot of interesting reconceptualization of what it means to learn a second foreign language in different, different contexts in which you learn it and different sort of points at which you stabilize and so on, uh, but not use the monolingual speaker as, as the model. So uh, I think this is all very resonant with uh, the systemic functional work as it's developed since the 50s, really. Thank so you, Patricia. a short comment to get started. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Um, Professor Halliday, Michael, would you like to talk to this? I, no, I, th I think um, Christian has said as much as and more than I think I could contribute myself. Uh, okay, and I think Kazu was the other person who was suggested, I'll turn to everybody in a moment, but Kazu, is there something you'd like to add? Um, yes, the question, uh, my sense is that we are living in a multilingual society, uh, like even in question coming from Brazil, and if you think that uh, different language is diff it depends on different order of differences, so where do you actually place dialects? or differences within the same one language, for example, if, you, if it is in Brazil, um, uh, Paulista in Sao Paulo speak differently from ca uh, Carioca in Rio de Janeiro, and Minas in Minas Gerais, they are again speak different languages. There, uh, there must be some uh, level of uh, mutual understanding, but there are also uh, mutual differences that uh, brings about misunderstanding and so on. So it's in a way, if you look at uh, language, but even in Brazilian context, if you go to north, probably uh, northeast, and I'm sure they speak differently. So in that respect, we are still you know, living in a multilingual environment rather than bilingual. So, mm -hmm. so you know, following, uh, following what Christian has said. Would anybody else like to comment on this? Mary. Well, I would like to say something about the multilingualism in our schools stimulating greater interest in a social interactive turn in linguistics. So while it's true that from the second language acquisition perspective there's been a social turn, as uh, Christian said about Alberta's uh, work, that social interactive turn in linguistics from SFL that the uh, writer is asking about hasn't influenced the training of teachers and the linguistics that's used to prepare teachers in our context. 
But what is pushing the linguistics that teachers are learning in our context is the growing multilingualism in our schools. So I think uh, that's going to be a positive way teacher education will evolve over the next years, is that increasing multilingualism calls for a social interactive turn in linguistics, and the only linguistics available that's taken that turn is systemic functional linguistics. So it's very promising in that sense. Thank you. Uh, Giovanni. Yeah, I mean, talking about a Chilean reality, maybe the, it's, it's quite the opposite in a way. Unfortunately, we have some, I mean, in, uh, original languages on the north and some other original language on the south. And uh, even though we have tried, I mean, with a, a lot of different uh, policies and efforts to have these communities uh, keep you know, on, on a bilingual state, I'm afraid that for a, a number of reasons, and political reasons, and social and cultural reasons, and economical reasons, they, they prefer to abandon their, their original languages and move into the, the Spanish. I don't know whether there is such a standard Spanish or not. Maybe there is, a, of course, a, in the south, in the north, but people from the Incas, I mean, Aboriginals, I mean, they feel um, isolated and it's and it, it's very difficult for them to get a job if they if the people understand or perceive they they because of the way they speak. Um, people from the Mapuche culture, for instance, in the south of, uh, of the south of Chile, they believe to be I mean bad people. Um, I don't know. There is a been a, a bad picture about them. So, unfortunately, what, or, or even happened with the people from Easter Island, they, if they want to go to the continent, as they say, uh, they prefer to, I mean, lose all the traits that they, that they are Eastern in, from Easter Island. So, from that perspective, I would say that from Chilean pers perspective, um, it's, uh, we are not moving into a bilingualism. Um, maybe it's a bilingualism with English. Okay, uh, which is, uh, I don't know, but uh, unfortunately with the original languages, it's all the way around. I believe that they are dying and uh, maybe the, the future is, is quite um, disastrous in a way. Good. So let me just check, you know, uh, yeah, sorry, we're going to go up to the audience to uh, Rakaia Hassan. We're just going to get a microphone up to her so we can hear from her. Thank you, Rakaia. Um, I might just uh, uh, go back to the original question and say that uh, the reason change is not such a wonderful word is because <clears throat> change is far less specific and one doesn't know what exactly it could mean. Now, so far as evolution is concerned, you can always say that it is response to the environment, to whatever survival within environment. And if you look at evolution, it is neither entirely good nor entirely bad. So for example, if you want to take a very good example of, the, of some evolution in English, you could look at what I called glib speak, the specific language of corporate uh, executives and uh, monopolists. Uh, you know, uh, here in, in um, Northern America, in England, in Europe, and, and so on. This is evolution. The language is there simply because it does something for us, and it is doing something for them. So that is one part that has evolved. Maybe it will continue maybe because it is impinging too much on other speakers, it'll discontinue. We don't know. So, uh, in, in other words, I don't think that evolution is something that we manage. Maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Let me check if there is another question from one of the chat rooms, and if there isn't, I'll get to raise a question from uh, within the group here. 
No? Okay, so I'm going to turn to Annabelle for a minute because uh, what she said in the introductory comments about going back to re-look at uh, issues and proposals that were made some time ago in order to re-examine them in a, a contemporary context struck me quite forcibly. Uh, in Annabelle's paper, she did exactly that. So we've got a specific instance we can draw on, which is the idea of cohesive harmony. My, I think I'm right in saying that that uh, article by Rakai Hassan was published in 1984. So Annabelle, for you, what is uh, the significance of analyses of cohesive harmony in text analysis? Uh, Thanks, and actually, uh, I have a lunch. Um, I had lunch with Maiti Tabuada, who has also used this work in her study of Spanish. And she was saying, you know, why is it people haven't widely used uh, this linguistic technology? Uh, so we were musing over that. But in re so, in relation to Jeff's question, and the reason I was using it in the work that I was doing was, uh, I take very seriously the idea that. Uh, context is encapsulated in language, as Halliday says in the 1985 book. Um, and I presented a paper along these lines about a year ago at Sydney University, and I had a post, a PhD student came up to me and say, you know, where's all the new stuff? You, you know, you were quoting people from back in the 80s. Like that was, you know, so long ago and a bad thing to do, which, you know, just underscores the earlier point that I was making. Now, uh, if we want to uh, elaborate uh, and develop methodologies which allow us to make the, the text context link, then it seems to me there's been, you know, there's been quite a lot of work on structure in the genre tradition. Uh, and in that tradition, the focus has been on relating structure to purpose. Um, and I, I, for, obviously, for me, something that is lacking in that work, and this is an instance of the disagreement I was also mentioning, uh, is that structure has to be expressed in some form. So it has to be textured, essentially. Now, what I was trying to do in that research and trying to present on Monday was what happens when you look from the perspective of texture to make claims about register and uh, by following some of the principles methodologically in cohesive harmony, i.e. Uh, what does the text look like from the perspective of con the fo forms of continuity, continuity by identity, continuity by similarity, chain interaction. These are principles that I believe uh, will help us develop robust registerial uh, descriptions we need a, uh, you know, enough, what's the word, critical mass of people doing work that's sufficiently comparable so that, you know, one of the claims I made based on a very small set of data was there's more going on through lexical cohesion than grammatical cohesion. Therefore, principles of identity, you know, tracking the same thing through a text is not that significant for some reason and I made a tentative uh, explanation of that. But for me to say there's an interesting probability going on in this small data set, uh, unless I can go over and see somebody else's work where they've used the, the method in a sufficiently similar fashion that I could say, yes, there is something that is significant here in terms of more work through lexical cohesion and less through uh, grammatical cohesion. Um, so uh, I think I've, an sorry, answered two questions, but just to get back to Jeff's question, uh, texture is the realisation of structure. Both of those principles are the manifestation of field, tenor and mode. And if you take seriously the view that uh, language is in text, text, con uh, text construes context, then to deliver on that link, structure is not enough. We have to look, uh, look at texture, uh, look at it, you know, do descriptions across strata and across metafunctions and try and bring them together and test out things like the context metafunction hookup hypothesis, things like that where we could really take uh, some more steps in terms of 
elaborating the theory and providing, I was going to say kick-ass descriptions, but that seems a little vulgar in this context, but, you know, descriptions that are robust, appliable and show the potential of the theory. Thank you. So we've got two points in play, I think. One is the general issue of cohesive harmony. The other is the issue of returning to uh, theoretical methodological proposals and uh, sustaining attention to them in order to test them thoroughly. I wonder if anybody else in the panel would like to comment. Jim. I mean, the way we could think about this is that we've had arguably four really successful exports over our life history, cohesion, genre, appraisal, and multimodality. So we could ask, why were those very successful exports that haven't necessarily all gone out of fashion yet? Partly they fill a niche in knowledge that's not full, so they're not competing with other ideas there. Partly they can be taken and consumed without learning necessarily very much of the rest of SFL, which is a big architecture. And thirdly, in terms of applicable linguistics, they have an applicable payoff. So if you're looking at why some ideas are used and successful or not, those are three things to worry about. Anybody else like to comment on that? Okay, well let me, uh, in the Vancouver audience, just open up the floor to further questions that people might like to propose here. Has anybody got a particular topic that they'd like to open up? We're sitting, for the audience on the web, we're sitting here very quietly at the moment, just generating some thoughts. If not, I, mm -hmm. uh, I can you. pick up something from the last point, but I didn't want to take over if there's anything else coming from the floor. So let's go to you, Michael. Yeah, so okay. Let's simply respond because Jim, in a sense, raises what is an, an issue that uh, is often, in fact, brought up, and particularly at conferences like this, people um, they say to me, well, look, you have a tremendous, if you like, theoretical mass here, density. Uh, we don't feel we can cope necessarily with all of it. Uh, do we need to? Jim's point about being, so to speak, selective. And it's a, it's a very important point, this. I think it's important to stress that it is one of the positive features of the theory uh, that uh, there is always uh, more resource, more mechanism available than is likely to be called on for any particular project. Uh, but that, I think, in, first of all, has to be seen, I hope, I mean, because I believe in it, uh, it has to be seen. I think it's a strength because what it implies is that, all right, I've been looking at my question from this point of view. Suppose I now want to change or someone else comes along and wants to go and look at it from around the back. Will it still hold up? Or will it all be destroyed because there's another bit of the theory that they haven't been looking at? So that, I think, is important. But at the same time, life is short and it is obviously true that many of those who are using and applying the theory um, haven't got the time to explore all aspects of it and in fact don't need to. The problem is, and the, this is the way I often used to put it to people asking me this, this kind of question, is, yeah, take the time to find out which aspects of the theory are relevant to the questions you want to ask. I mean, try and make those questions explicit. We talk to people and say, well, look, as Jim was saying, there are certain features, not necessarily those four, but many, many other aspects which look to me important uh, for you in the context of this particular issue, which, which might be anything in all the fields in which uh, linguistics has been applied, forensic linguistics, clinical linguistics, educational work, and, and so on. So I think it, it's, it's certainly you don't need to try and get a hold of everything, though I have to say that it is important that we should have people who try to do this too. Uh, I'm reminded not long ago I was... Uh, uh, talking to a, uh, someone in a medical faculty, and, uh, who, and I made a comment. He was asking me about what I was, what I'd done in linguistics, and I said, "But really, you know, I'm a dinosaur in this field because I was a generalist, and you can't be a generalist any longer because there are too many things going on." You know? And he said to me, "In medicine, it is the generalist who is the most highly prized." <laughs> <laughs> so we do need that as well. But having said that, my point is. Find, take the time to find out what you need to have at your equipment and then work on that. Thank you very much. So I think we have a question from the audience. This is from Robin Fawcett from Cardiff. Well, not so much a question, but taking up Michael's point and some of the examples he brought out. 
such as forensic linguistics. Jim gave us a quick sort of off-the-cuff list of um, areas of successful export. Well, they're ones that would come to your mind because they're areas in which you were largely associated, and I think they're all absolutely valid. But we have had other areas of export, and the one that comes to my mind, and probably to perhaps the Christians too, because we've both worked in this area, is computational linguistics. It is really, when you look back at the history of it, it's quite astonishing that the field of natural language generation, with the word generation in its title, although not in the Chomsky sense, eventually became almost completely dominated in the 19, late 80s and 1990s by systemic functional grammar. It is not so dominated now, it's maybe because some of us have moved on into different areas, but there was a time when we were extraordinarily influential, and that was a successful export. And I think you could make the same case for a number of other areas. Um, it hasn't been developed as much, but forensic linguistics is certainly one. Um, it just often coincides with when particular people were active and, yeah. and, 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 and pushing that frontier forward. It's a great pity that Malcolm Coulthard at Birmingham took retirement when he did. He then uh, was given an honorary attachment at Cardiff University, where we, and the forensic linguistics MA was moved from Birmingham to Cardiff. And the unfortunate thing then was that the field leader contracted a, a very sad illness, which meant that she could no longer carry on teaching. These little accidents of history, when people retire, somebody falls ill, which may affect the development or not of a particular area. But I think, personally, that our broad theory uh, has an immense number of fields of application and of export, and we don't really know the full scope yet. And if I was to name one more, it would be the illumination of, of verbal art, of uh, what used to be called literary stylistics. I'm sure there's a long way to go in that area, and indeed all aspects of stylistic variation. So I, I'll leave it there. But I'd like to invite people from the floor, perhaps, on, or on the panel, to name other areas where our general theory has made or could make major contributions. Just point out there's two questions here. What are we exporting and where are we exporting it to? I was listing exports. You're listing regions of application. Uh, <laughs> 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 we're just returning the microphone to, uh, to Robin. You were listing exports, bits of the theory which have been taken and applied. I mean, okay. Um, I actually have a worry about that, which perhaps, and I think a number of people do, and it's perhaps important to air them. I think there are some considerable dangers, and the first one that was successfully exported, if it was successfully, it was the cohesion, cohesion framework. Um, I've, I've been an external on PhDs. I have looked at the area of um, um, psychological medicine, is one, one name for it, I put in a major research proposal with a professor of psychological medicine at Cardiff to the Medical Research Council. And I got, became familiar with the literature that people in that field uh, knew about for, for language. What did they know about? They knew about Chomsky's view of syntax, and they knew about cohesion. Because it's a nice, simple framework which you can take and apply without knowing an awful lot about the nature of lexicodrama. Uh, and I think that's dangerous. It was helpful in a way, and we would like, one would like to think it was a way in for those people, but it wasn't. They went in that far, used that, tried to put it with a bit of Chomsky, tried to apply it in psychological medicine, actually a field, Jim, that you know a bit about, because you contributed to it with your book, Crazy Talk. Um, but um, I think there are dangers, as it were, in, in some of these apparent exports. I'm going to come back to, uh, to Annabelle because it seems to me that the, the conversation has taken a slightly different turn from what you were referring to in terms of building up knowledge within the theory. Is, is that right? Um, yes, and I guess I'd come back to also Michael's point that you know, there, there is a degree of complexity by having an extravagant theory and that that is a function of 
Michael pursuing the question, what is language like and how does it work? So taking actually a very simple but kind of profound question and pursuing that. And it is from that question of saying, what does language work, how does language work, not just in this environment, not just on this scale, but as a social semiotic that enables this miraculous range of things uh, to be done, that it seems to go on growing and so on. And so it's from this very elegant question that the complexity arises. So there are dangers, I think, in, you know, Jim has articulated that certain aspects of the theory have an export quality by virtue of background in complexity. Now, there's, there's obviously advantages and disadvantages. I personally would never have come across the theory were it not for genre. I was in an educational institution myself where people were actively taking up the theory now. So I may never have heard the term systemic functional linguistics had Jim not done what he'd done in terms of the development of genre. Um, at the same time, reductiveness comes at a cost uh, in that people potentially misread the potential of the theory. So then do you have to somehow later on come back and say, hang on, that's not the whole story, there's more to this story than what we have exported under the, this situation. Um, so, uh, did I answer your question there? Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that was the idea. To, to go uh, deep, deep into the theory. Oh, to, sorry, we've got somebody from Brazil who wants to raise a question. Then we're going to go up to John Knox. Okay. Can I, yeah. He says here, uh, my name is Hans Peter Weiser. He's from Brazil. He greets everybody and he says, congratulations to the organizers. He says, as you may know, the sixth Congress of Latin America, um, Systemic Functional Linguistics, is to be held in Fortaleza this year in Brazil, Northeast Brazil is organized under the motto Systemic Functional Linguistics and its potential for semiotic discursive empowerment. I would like to know if the theme of this Congress can be seen as a sign that Systemic Functional is approximating to more critical issues and is going to incorporate a more political agenda. Can we expect that Systemic Functional, in the systemic functional Linguistics in the future will assume a more interdisciplinary character Okay. <laughs> Is there anybody who would like to comment particularly on that? So, uh, uh, oh, Christian, thank you. Very quick, because I think uh, I'll leave it to others to f fill out. Uh, I mean, it seems to me that uh, that uh, the sort of notion of appliability has been there from the beginning in the 50s, uh, and that that's uh, you know, it's, it's an awesomely powerful notion in terms of critical, in other, whether, in other words, what I mean is it subsumes critical as it's usually used in one, in one corner, in one area. Uh, but there are so many other activities, and if you, if you sort of pull back and you say, you know, what can we do to improve the human condition, uh, then uh, surely that is critical in terms of what a theory of language or semiotic systems uh, can do, and the notion of appliability seems to me to be a very broad one. Then that, uh, and a number of things that we mentioned, Robin, you mentioned this this work in in, in uh, sort of an area of, of healthcare medicine, uh, for example. Now that wouldn't probably be on the agenda of of a critical approach, uh, a critical discourse analysis, and so on, but. It's an enormously important one, and it's one that appliable, appliable linguistics would have been developed to address, among other many, many other areas. Okay. Uh, all the all the work in the educational sector, uh, surely this is critically important, even if it's not uh, often not in the in the scope of critical uh, critical discourse analysis. Thank you very much, Christian. Uh, Michael. I mean, it's a very good question, this, and I think it's important to say it's not so much as which way will the theory go. It's much more, I think, to be asked in terms of, okay, you have some activity, some agenda that you want to engage in. Will you find this theory or some aspects of the theory useful? And there are certain forms of political activity, this is the example of your question of nature, uh, in which you well might, and that's not at all new to the theory. But 
uh, I think it has to be looked at that way round, rather than, so to speak, is it a property of the whole theory that it will move all this and that in this or that direction? Thank you very much. And Mary. Uh, and just further related to that, I, I think, too, it's a question of what we choose then to analyze and how we make decisions about using the linguistics to show how a text means what it does so that we are the ones who are political, not the theory, <laughs> and it's the choices that we make about what we choose to analyze and the points we choose to draw from that analysis that can have the impact that the, the questioner is talking about. I so up to John Knox, who's uh, working on Twitter. So I don't know whether this is a John Knox question or a Twitter question, but let's uh, hear what it is. Sorry, it's a John Knox question. I'm not <laughs> sure that I'm tweeting to anyone but myself up here. Um, but uh, the, uh, Mary's comment there that, um, that we make the choices, and so um, that's quite interesting because coming back to the comment I wanted to make, it positions us as dangerous, all of us as dangerous. And the, the comments that um, exporting our theory is dangerous, well, if it is, I think it's a risk that we should be prepared to take um, because there's no point in having something great that never gets used and doesn't get out there. You know, I, So the, the idea that saying it's dangerous to export and then bringing that as a reason not to engage with other communities and get out there, I, I disagree with that position. Thank you. So, Jim. Uh, I would add that to taking the risk and going out there is the best way to drive your theory forward. If you think waiting in your academic sphere is the way to develop theory and arguing with academics, that's just centripetal. Okay, so, yes, sir. Um, I agree with that, but I think we need to keep a clear distinction between the knowledge production and recontextualization in Bernstein's terms. So we may modify the theory for the process of recontextualization, that is applying it in a context outside the academy. Uh, and obviously we want a productive dialogue in terms of how do the questions in other people's sphere of life drive aspects of the theory. But uh, as academics, I think we also need to keep clear the distinction between, you know, what is a theoretical a theoretical representation of the theory for the purposes of theory building, and what is, a, you know, a recontextualised version where the audience is towards the applicability of some aspect of the theory. And to Diane Potts, who, while the microphone is being taken to her, let me just say that she's the person who first proposed this idea of uh, <laughs> uh, web-based. Uh, access to the discussion. So, yeah, so if you're having problems hearing, it's my fault. Um, what changes if the question is semiotic evolving rather than language evolving? And by that I don't mean the move to the multimodal, but I'm thinking more of the, the specialist versus the generalist, the glib speak, the complexity that Annabelle is referring to. If we think in terms of both the potential applicability of the work of where our work needs to go, what changes if we think of it as semiotic evolving and already at that fourth level? Hmm. We're sitting here thinking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Does anybody want to comment immediately or should we come, uh, Christian? And I think just very, very quickly. Uh, I mean, my, my sense is that, uh, again, throughout most of human history, uh, depending on how far back we take it, of course. Uh, but if we take it back, say, 2.2 million years, but we could take it further, Homo habilis and or Homo erectus a bit later. But So in that sense, uh, I think uh, language evolving has been, you know, human semiotic or proto-semiotic evolving. Uh, so I think the, the sort of sense of, of a clearer separation between language and paralanguage and, and other semiotic systems sort of somatic semiotic systems, bodily based, I mean, with body as, as the expression plane, the signifying body, body in, in called to both sense, and sort of uh, exosomatic semiotic systems, cave paintings and so on. Uh, in some sense, uh, you know, these are more recent, uh, and it seems to be entirely plausible uh, that proto-language, proto-languages were from the start multimodal in their expression, 
so you have had people talking about the evolution of human languages, like Michael Kobales from New Zealand, uh, in a book called From Hand to Mouth. From mouth to, no, from hand to mouth, yes, exactly. Uh, where he argues, as other people have, uh, that uh, human language was in the early phase of evolution gestural. Uh, now, I don't see any particular, I mean, there's no very clear evidence for this, I think. Uh, rather, it seems to me it's much more plausible that it was uh, multi, multimodal in that sense, a proto-linguistic sense from the beginning. And it's with the, with the evolution of archaic language and then modern language that I think perhaps there's a clearer separation, but they've kept, I think, co-evolving. Uh, and I think that's, that's very, very important to keep in view. And the, say the study of, uh, by, by um, Dan Slobin, Jim Lantoff and others of, uh, of you know, uh, lexicogrammatical construal of some area of experience like motion through space together with a gesture, uh, right, that these form a, 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 a unified system in some sense in the construal of motion through space in face-to-face -face conversation. Uh, I think this is clear evidence for, for this kind of situation. Uh, and it's very, very interesting to relate this to Giovanni, to, to, to this uh, sort of empirically evidenced research you're doing on, on sort of uh, uh, writing in printed matter, because surely this is also a matter of co evolution. Uh, and uh, I mean, you were giving some examples of earlier, earlier work, but, but the sort of the relationship between image diagrams and so on, and, and, and the verbal text, this, this has changed through, through the evolution, yeah. right? Yeah. And Michael, I think you, did you indicate you wanted to add uh, No, I, I, was, I, I was still pondering the question, <laughs> I'm not sure I, I followed it fully, but let me just comment briefly, I mean, in relation to what I was talking about in, in my paper this week was right, the way that linguists have looked at the evolution of language. They had the evolution of models, and as we all know, uh, it took them some way, uh, but it was too restricted in its concept of the environment in which changes took place, uh, and I think, uh, in, in, uh, in particular, it wasn't, it was monostrate, or it was only operating on one trade at the time. Uh, now, the point that I was making, now this may not be relevant, so I'm not going to add to it at great length, but it, what you were asking, I think, also related to uh, the point that I was making that, all right, the evolution of language is also the evolution of meaning. And so we need, uh, we need more tools, actually, for uh, sorting this out, more evidence uh, of all kinds. Uh, it's the, uh, the development of the corpus has changed history in this sense, and we, get, uh, we can now kind of expand the dimensions in which we look at this. Uh, in terms of simply the relation between that and, the, and uh, the, the evolution of language as a whole, the only point I would make is we can treat this as part of the evolution of language. In other words, we're defining meaning that not as semiotic but semantic. I mean, semantics is meaning in language, as it were, as opposed to semiotics meaning in general. But then, in turn, that becomes part of that whole, uh, that, that wider environment. Um, but that's even harder. Good. Well, thank you. We're coming towards the end of the time that we've got already. Um, but since we're operating in the virtual world, I want to uh, say that I've just had a virtual message. And uh, the virtual <laughs> message is from the Ford Foundation. And uh, they're going to give us virtually a million dollars for research. And it has to be in the field of uh, language development. So would anybody like to comment on what you think should be the next major set of projects that we should adopt? Because it seems to me that in our discussion so far in the uh, Congress, just to be a little bit more serious about it for a moment, we've foregrounded lots of aspects of development and evolution. Uh, but though people have referred to language development ontogenetically, it hasn't occupied a large part of our discussion. So I'm just going to invite you, if you want to, to comment on what you think should be some of the topics for uh, developmental studies in the, the medium range of the theories of development. Can we have two months to think about it? <laughs> <laughs> no, unfortunately, there is a deadline for the research. <laughs> let, let me just make a quick point because I've been saying this to one or two people and I feel very strongly about it. I mean, they do mean ontogenetic development. They do mean development in yes, that sense. Yes. Okay, good. 
I mean, great that they're calling it language development, but that's the first point. Yes, so, they're very informed yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, Well, I mean, I was talking to someone this morning about it, but it, it still amazes me uh, how little evidence there is on early childhood proto-language and, uh, and language. I mean, from my own work way back now in the late 70s, early 70s, I was always convinced of the importance, the value of that very old strategy is known as the diary approach or the journal approach. That is intensively observing uh, one child, maybe, or most one family, but getting really, really detailed a picture of the, uh, of the development of language as opposed to simply you know, uh, sampling 90 seconds every other day or something like that. Now, I'm not knocking that when it also provides evidence of a different kind. But so I would simply say, well, uh, uh, um, this is very much, a, you know, just off the top of my head at short notice, but surely it's time to get some more evidence from around the world based on that particular approach. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, that's, uh, that's a fairly cheap way to do research, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so we've still got quite a reserve of funding left uh, in our Four Foundation grant. Well, uh, and <laughs> I mean, it's not cheap in terms of time. I don't think that at all. It's very expensive. Exactly. But, uh, I mean, I thank the Canadian... I, it is thanks to the Canadian government that I was able to do it because they wouldn't let me into Canada, so I had a year and a half unemployed. I could listen to my child and talk. <laughs> Professor Halliday's referring to an event, uh, I think, in 1970 or 71 when uh, he wasn't given a visa to come here. But uh, in 2007, we welcomed him back and gave him an honorary doctorate, and uh, the president and he were able to laugh about it. So we're glad about that. Uh, would anybody else like to comment? Jim. I'm an interventionist, so I can spend the money. So what I want is a school, K to 12, put in a genre-based pedagogy, take the kids through the 12 years. Let's see what kids can do, because we sold them so short now. We've got no idea what they can do. Let's find out. Mary? Yeah. Uh, related to that, I, I feel like there's a tremendous waste of human potential today that we are not offering our children the kinds of environments they need to really develop their potential, and that language has a huge role to play in the development of human potential. So a uh, context in which children are given a rich language context, uh, environment, ways of developing, their own meaning-making potential in many languages and in a variety of contexts and fields, that's where I would put the money. Mm. Thank you. Anybody yeah, else? A, a couple of ideas. Uh, I think that maybe one of the challenges is that even though some people may believe that linguistic is not that kind of science, I also believe that, I do believe that we need to go through a kind of cumulative a scientific work. I believe that uh, sometimes we do uh, the same everywhere and repeat the same things so many times. I, I attend so many conferences and unfortunately I see many people doing the same and uh, I say, well, but I, I've seen this so many times, but yeah, but this is with six texts and this is now being done with two texts and now it's with three <laughs> texts. Yeah, but it's, 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 it's the same story, it's the same thing. And it's sad that linguistics work, I mean, it works this way. Uh, at least for me, I know that maybe, I mean, you may disagree. I, I believe that people believe this is the right way to develop I mean, linguistics. Unfortunately, I mean, I don't agree with that idea. I believe that there is another possibility that we should, I mean, go for cumulative work. I mean, once an idea is established with a robust corpus and is clearly and, and, and sophisticated, I mean, uh, produced, I mean, there is no need to go through it again, as unfortunately I believe we do. And so, so, so many exhausting times. And, uh, uh, and that's something that I believe that is a weak point in our area because when some other people, look at us, they see that we are kind of moving around the same bush for so many days and so many years. So, I mean, one thing is that I believe that we should, I mean, go up for this and try to change this. And I, I don't know exactly how to do that, but I think it's a, it's a thing that we all should 
face and, and try to move on with, with this idea. And I mean, take the water to my own bottle, okay? I, I would say that Corpus Linguistics is a way of doing so. I mean, <laughs> gathering large data and having robust corpora that the, the empirical results are results that are not debatable, okay? And that's one thing. And the other thing is that, I mean, and I'm sure that Mary is going to agree with me, that, that <laughs> there is a separation between, uh, at least I'm talking from Latin America, and I want to see it, what I see in Europe at least, is a, a strong separation between the, the work that we do in, uh, on linguistics and what happens in what we call education. So education is, is a, at least in Latin America, is a totally different thing. Linguists are not, I mean, um, I mean, they don't pay attention to what we do. So there is a break. So what we, when we want to say something about reading comprehension or, or writing, for instance, it's, this is on the hands of what they call methodologists or didactics, so I don't know the exact right word in, in, in English. And uh, they come from different areas. And I, I believe that that's something that, I mean, produces the state of the art that we have in education. So I don't know how, but I mean, I think that the voice of the, I mean, em empirical linguistics also should be, I mean, raised, okay? And we should find a, it's a challenge, and, it's, and I would like to, in two or three years more, say, okay, we have these connections, and we are advancing in, in this way. Because I know that in Australia you, you are together in a way, but I also know that you have problems with this. So, I mean, this seems to be a problem that is everywhere. And we complain, and complaining, <laughs> okay, but what are we doing? Yeah. And I think that that's a challenging point that we should face somehow. Well, we've got another a little bit of money and it's over to Annabelle to spend it. Uh, in fact, just extending the point that's just been made, the, if I had to answer in one word, infrastructure would be the word. Uh, so we need to conceptualise what systemic, you know, corpus-based systemic functional linguistics infrastructure looks like. And to get anywhere, actually we need a fair bit of money uh, and that would allow us to show the potential of the theory, but we've got to be able to show the potential of the theory to get the money. So we're in this kind of uh, catch-22 situation. Um, so that, to me, if there's, if there's money that's going, uh, it would be to see how we take the next few steps so that we set up a degree of communication and that we resolve to agree on some set of principles, which means uh, subordinating ego to some degree so that we all agree to do a certain set of things the same way as a way of building up, starting to build up comparability of description that allows us to uh, deliver on the theory. Thank you. Well, it's time to stop. So let me just uh, greet people very warmly from Vancouver, uh, to the class in Brazil in particular. We're delighted that you joined us and uh, we look forward to meeting you, not virtually, but uh, materially sometime before too long. Best wishes for your work uh, and to people who are now just uh, having breakfast in <laughs> Beijing or wherever it might be in China and people in Nigeria who've joined us and in India. Uh, greetings and uh, thank you very much for coming. Um, I want just to, I've already thanked Diane, but uh, as you've noticed, uh, Andrew DeWard, who's the coordinator of the Digital Literacy Centre, and Dax Sorrenti, who's our graduate academic assistant, they're the people who put a lot of time into uh, organising <laughs> two of our outstanding graduate students who've done a lot of the infrastructure work too, Micah and Ryan, who's here nearby somewhere. Uh, thank you, there he is. No, he's not. There he is over there. Thank you very much to you oh. as well. <laughs> and finally, to the uh, plenary panelists, thank you so much for your generous contribution, both to the Congress and also to this particular session. Very much appreciated.